When one explores the most fascinating and ancient of structures resting all over our planet, you will inevitably be confronted by baffling feats on engineering and ingenuity, tasks that, to modern man, escape understanding or indeed explanation. The main consensus regarding these ancient structures has always been a tricky thing to explain. To claim that these marvelous structures were built by primitive people with only primitive tools at their disposal does not only seem absurd to most who have visited such sites, but ignorant of their true past grandeur and the specific characteristics of each of these places. Ancient sites, such as Giza, Machu Picchu, among many others, still contain very confusing artifacts, anomalous evidence, which tells a very different story to that of mainstream history. Apart from the Baghdad Battery, largely claimed to have been an ancient form of electroplating, there has been little in the way of physical evidence to suggest the use of electricity within the academically researched ancient times. Yet, there are many remnants left which suggest such activities. Not only are there countless clear examples of past machine work stone, but most importantly, there is evidence of errors made by these same tools, misstarts and discovered fault lines, these particular stones discarded, laid bare in the quarries, revealing all the hallmarks of the machine engineering that went into building these wonderful places, these artifacts, once rubbish, now historical treasures. They can tell you the shape and movements of the tools that were being used, showing just how these machines cut into the stones, core drillings also discarded during manufacture, and cut stones discarded due to faults and cracks, revealing the complete preliminary cut marks left by the ancient stone cutters. These fragments of past activities are clearly some of the most important in unraveling these sites' ultimate secrets, yet it is rarely shared in the public arena and even less frequently researched by official bodies. Along with this vast and perplexing array of remnants, mercilessly left where they fell, strewn amongst the debris of disruption, lay countless extremely hardy machine stone jars, vessels made from some of the hardest rocks on Earth. Some of these jars were made with a round bottom, perfectly machined, balanced on a base no bigger than the tip of a chicken's egg. Sir William Flinders Petrie ultimately realized that only lathe turning could have produced the symmetry and balance found on thousands of these bowls and vases. And Petrie was no fool. In 1894, he founded his own archaeological body, the Egyptian Research Account, which later became the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. He stated, for example, a bowl maker attained curves of exact circularity by rotating the bowl around a fixed blade and formed a lip by shifting the centering of the bowl. Another round bottom vase had walls of such uniform thickness that it balanced perfectly on a curved base. To have a very well-respected researcher and specialist of the ancient Egyptians to admit to a conviction of the use of power tools in these pots construction seems like quite a stunning position to take, especially when one considers that while metal chisels could have been used to shape soft limestone within ancient Egyptian times, the metals that were available to them – copper, bronze, and during the first millennium BCE, wrought iron – were far too soft to work such rock into such exquisite designs. It seems Petri would like to remain honest regarding his conclusions, yet also incomplete with his explanations preferring to let the receiver of said information make their own realizations, preferring to avoid complication by a, by this time, rather visible enemy. One could only conclude that these relics and ancient monuments thereof were not the work of the Egyptians. But further evidence to suggest that these baffling structures were built far before the ancient Egyptians, before academic understandings, by a highly technologically advanced pre-cataclysm civilization. We find it difficult to see how such work was undertaken or an explanation for our finding can be made without the use of power tools. Thankfully, the more we learn regarding these enigmatic places, the more we become aware of regarding their true history, and the closer, it seems, we become to finding those who built them. Along with the many other unexplainable feats, undoubtedly left by a highly advanced, highly capable lost civilization, 
there are the countless examples of extreme precision stone cutting. Not only is this remarkable pass capability visible in their many stone walls and fortresses alike, but also in their exquisite artwork. If we look upon the statues of ancient Egypt, for example, the symmetry, along with the proportional precision present within their statues, is not only perfection personified, but unquestionably far too advanced for the so-called academically claimed builders to have achieved. According to the academics, along with their subsequent supposed accurate writings, these extraordinary feats of artistic perfection were somehow created by a group of individuals who were merely equipped with copper tools. Not only is this claim clearly ignorant of reality, but to create such works of symmetrical accuracy was unquestionably the work of a group of individuals far more advanced than even that of the Victorians, let alone those who thrived along the banks of the Nile more than 3,000 years ago. Not only is this precision present along the Giza Plateau, but it is also found at ancient sites all around the world. Masterfully created statues and structures, often carved straight out of stone bedrock, with such vision and artistic prowess that many now presume that the individuals capable of such feats must have had advanced machinery at their disposal. Most of ancient India, for example, is created with such delicacy and exactness that we today could only accomplish the same with the utilization of modern machines. Furthermore, many scholars and independent researchers, even a number of highly recognized academic Egyptologists, have reluctantly concluded that many of the basalt, gypsum, and other vases shaped from extremely hard stones, and indeed a number of multi-ton sarcophagus lids, were indeed turned into the shapes we see them as today, on some kind of ancient, enormous lathe. This conclusion is made regardless of the fact that to create such enormous stoneworks on a lathe would have undoubtedly been out of the realms of capabilities for those who are currently claimed as their creators. Not only do the ornamental artifacts of Egypt and much further afield strongly indicate machined working, but there is also overwhelming evidence of these same machines reminiscent of modern stone cutting equipment present all over the world. Yet, conveniently, it is quietly ignored by the same individuals who have supposedly unraveled the history of these sites. Puma Panku, Giza's basalt floor, other areas throughout Giza, Peru, Malta, the list goes on. All these sites not only indicate an advanced, highly capable constructor, but also possess countless marks that, as of yet, we can only explain logically as having been left by precision, quick-rotation, stone-cutting machinery. They are yet another overwhelming collection of evidence, which not only flies in the face of current academic explanation, but proof of an advanced, now lost civilization having once been responsible for these sites construction. They are highly compelling. Although there are many aspects of Cappadocia in which we have touched upon in the past, mentioned its apparent incredible antiquity, and to some degree investigated and explored some hand-picked sections of this incredible site's numerous anomalous features. However, there also exists, although considerably lesser shared, an equally enigmatic yet seemingly additional hidden past. A fascinating area of study, which we feel requires far more in-depth study. Cappadocia is seemingly home to more than one very ancient, now lost civilizations, littered with seemingly prehistoric ruins, treasures of antiquity, invaluable in our ongoing attempts at understanding our distant past. During the following synopsis, we intend to put forward sufficient evidence to suggest that not just one advanced, now lost civilization once called this place home, but that the site was once home to more than one extremely ancient yet extremely well-preserved legacies from what we recognize as ruins left by varying civilizations. We feel that due to the site's location, it has, predictably, yet we presume reluctantly, undergone substantial academic explorations, 
most possibly to create a permitted chronology, whether accurate or not, for the history of the site. With a rarely experienced buzz within mainstream circles, surrounding futile attempts accompanied with supposed explorations and explanations for many of these still visually stunning yet utterly puzzling sites. Anyone with an alternative opinion regarding the site, however, one we often conclude to be logical grounded, accompanied by many examples of incredible artistic abilities, comparatively impossible to have achieved with the tools accessible to the academically claimed builders. One often senses that many funded, obedient academics find themselves considerably out of their depth when it comes to producing a solid intellectual explanation for the many anomalies we highlight. Encountering almost impossible tasks in producing logical explanations for not only Cappadocia's almost inconceivably huge labyrinths of underground complexes, some so large they are classified as underground cities, each and all hewn direct from solid bedrocks, some to considerable depths, now understood to plummet hundreds of feet into the rock of Earth's mantle. The more impossible this task seems to become. The challenges involved in explaining, and most crucially demonstrating, how these mazes of tunnels and passageways were created and in addition secured. These ancient builders somehow, utilizing enormous rolling stones, that modern man would find to be a considerable and extremely effective obstacle, once painstakingly carved, transported, and placed into their purpose-built ruts, somehow becoming a working blocking mechanism, which, to this day, we still don't fully understand how they work them, or even manage to unravel any logical technique possibly once used to utilize these incredible blocking stones. However, as previously mentioned, it is not just these incredibly ancient underground labyrinths which make Cappadocia one of antiquity's least understood, yet clearly one of the most important ancient locations on Earth. There are many other parts of this enormous ancient wonder that many people are predictably little aware of, and the reason for this may soon become apparent. Although underground layers, such as that of Derinkuyu, have an appearance akin to the Neolithic Age, in other words, displaying the scars of relics which are unimaginably old, although located in the open air and at the mercy of the far more rapid erosion triggered by weathering the site, and also displays sections which show advanced stone-cutting technologies, absent the tunnels, and was clearly created at a much more recent date, which, unlike the sites which display extremely ancient ages, namely the underground cities, are seemingly from a vastly different time in antiquity. Hopefully, as the evidence and knowledge regarding said sites grows, we will hopefully, one day, fully decipher the mysteries of not only Cappadocia, but our own past as a whole. It is a subject which we find highly compelling. In 1914, archaeologists found an astonishing location in Ganung Padang, in Indonesia. Two ancient stone mountains rest in this region, mountains in the form of pyramids, their size is truly massive. Intrigued by their shape, this 1914 team initiated a series of test digs in the small likelihood that they were man-made. The proposition of these two huge land features actually being pyramids, must have been virtually unthinkable to these initial explorers, their subsequent excavation also concluded that the site was indeed a natural formation. However, fast forward 100 years of technological advances in archaeology, photography, ground penetrating radar and satellite imaging, and we can now take much deeper looks at locations, gaining far greater insight than was possible a century ago. The archaeological societies are currently in a panic, in regards to an expedition which is being undertaken to this very site. Over 100 years after its initial discovery and disregardment, what is interesting to note, a detail this team must be aware of, a detail largely suppressed and rarely discussed, is the fact that very ancient monuments rest upon the tops of each mountain, monuments that were later dated at 2,500 years old, and confirmed as artificial megalithic structures. The reason the archaeological community is worrying, is due to their possible size. They would dwarf the Great Pyramids of Giza. 
However, the pyramids in Giza are in a very special location. They in fact rest on the center of the world's land mass. The question would be, why would Indonesia possess such ginormous pyramids? In 2010, geologist Dr. Daninata Wijaja, who earned a doctorate at Caltech, recognized the mountains as possible man-made pyramids, and began to explore using ground-penetrating radar, seismic tomography, resistivity survey and other remote sensing techniques, as well as some direct excavations and deep core drilling. The results were immediately intriguing, producing evidence of deeply buried man-made chambers and yielding carbon dates going back as far as 26,000 years. This would make the construction prior to the last ice age. Such ideas are heresy to mainstream archaeologists. The archaeological establishment in Indonesia banded together against Dr. Nato Wijaja and his team, lobbied the political authorities, agitated locally and succeeded in slowing down, though not completely stopping, the further exploration of Ganung Padang. However Dr. Nato Wijaja fought back, doing some high-level lobbying of his own, taking the matter to the president of Indonesia himself. There were further delays to do with elections in Indonesia but just a couple of months ago, the final obstacles were lifted and Dr. Nato Wijaga and his team moved back on to the Ganung Padang site with full approval to go ahead with their work, including permission to excavate the concealed chambers. Although it may not be widely received, this excavation may be the most important currently being undertaken on Earth. Mainstream archaeologists are furious, and have been lobbying to get the work stopped, fortunately to no avail. Preliminary excavations have produced results that prove beyond doubt that Ganung Padang is indeed a man-made pyramid of great antiquity. Even the relatively young layer so far excavated, the second artificial columnar rock layer beneath the megalithic site visible on the surface, has yielded dates of 5200 BC, nearly 3000 years older than the orthodox dating for the pyramids of Giza in Egypt. They are also firm indications from the original remote sensing and core drilling work that there is much older layers below. In short, it is now evident to all that the site is vastly older than the 2,500 years archaeologists had insisted upon for decades. Even the most hostile are now quietly reframing their assessment of the site and referring to it as a gigantic terrace tomb, which was part of the biggest megalithic culture in the archipelago. I will keep you posted.